Hi guys, Drew back again with Princess Craft RV and today we are going to be walking through the appliances and the accessories on the Intec Terra Oasis. Right up front here, first thing we're going to talk about is going to be the loading and unloading procedure. So the Terra Oasis here is going to ride on a 2 and 5 16 inch ball. Our starting position is going to be with our slide latch in the unlocked position. It will stay back there to help us uh, effectively load or unload the unit. Now we're going to back our tow vehicle underneath the coupler here, centering, centering ourselves as best as we can. Once we've done so, we can go ahead and use our electric tongue jack, lowering that coupler fully down on top of that ball. Once fully seated, we are, will take our slide latch, sliding that forward, making sure we are engaging both of these teeth there fully onto the frame. Now, once we are secured onto the ball, we take our tow chains, cross those underneath the coupler, making sure we have enough room to make our turns left or right, but not so much room that they may make contact with the pavement. Also, riding right along next to those chains is going to be our emergency breakaway cable. Now, this is a very important piece of safety equipment, and we're going to secure this to the tow vehicle with a third or separate connection point, whether that be a carabiner or a quick link. Now, this is our last line or our last safety feature. If any of these other tow components were to become compromised as the two vehicles started to separate, this is going to act like a ripcord to the electric brake system trying its best to avoid a runaway camper scenario. Also, we have our seven-way plug here. This will plug into the corresponding bumper receptacle of the tow vehicle. This is going to give us full function to your tow vehicle's braking system, uh, marker lights, tail lights, charging system, all of that stuff. Uh, one thing you do want to make sure is, is that this is fully inserted, and so the keeper on the top of the seven-way receptacle uh, is going to keep that in place while going down the road. Now hopping up here, we have our electric tongue jack. Uh, this has two buttons. One is going to be a light switch that would give us a point of reference if we are backing up to the unit uh, after dark or also aid in making any of those connections again after dark. And then we have an extend and retract here uh, that corresponds with the travel position of the jack. Now in the event that we have a power loss situation, if we were to go ahead and remove this black plug that we have here on top of the jack, that's going to allow us to manipulate that manually. We're gonna use a three quarter inch socket or our three quarter inch stabilizer jack handle to accomplish that. And then directly behind that, we have our rock guard. Uh, this is going to, of course, cover this beautiful front window that we have while traveling. Uh, now this is held in place with a couple different features. Uh, if we look up top of the window, we do see a rail that runs the full width of the window. Uh, we're going to directionalize this accordingly. We will slide the uh, corresponding uh, fabric through that rail, being careful that we're not catching it on the corners of each side. Once we have done so, you can see that we do have snaps that run uh, the full diameter of that window that are going to allow us to secure that further. And then behind that further, we have two 20 pound propane cylinders. These will be full for you at time of delivery. Uh, they are separated by a T-bar and a regulator. Uh, if we are going to take a look here at the regulator, uh, whichever way this arrow is directionalized to, we're going to consider that to be our primary propane cylinder. Uh, of course, the other one would be our secondary. And this is an automatic switchover regulator. So in this current configuration, if it were to use the entirety of your primary tank and we have the service valve of our secondary tank in the open position it's going to automatically switch over to that secondary tank and start drawing off of that now if in the interim we want to go ahead and remove our primary tank and have that refilled what we're going to do is just switch this over to our secondary tank we would then unscrew this oversized wing nut here at the top do our best to rotate our t-bar out of the way making sure our service valve on the primary tank is turned off, disconnecting our pigtail and lifting that out for service. Now going down the road, this is all covered here uh, by our propane tank cover. What you're gonna go ahead and do is you're going to do your best to line this up here on the two studs, allow those to come here through this keyhole. And once you have accomplished that, and it can be a bit fiddly sometimes, um, once you've accomplished that, you're going to go ahead and take your cotter pins and pin that into place and keep that nice and secure 
again while going down the road. As we make our way around the camper, the first thing you're going to notice is going to be our driver's side stabilizer jack. Now these are going to be located on all four corners of the unit. These are to go ahead and stabilize the unit while in use. Uh, they are not for leveling. Uh, once we have achieved our level, we will go ahead and run these down. We'll make contact with the pavement and maybe a quarter turn or half turn more. Again, just to stabilize that floor so it doesn't feel like we're kind of walking around on the suspension. To do so, you're going to use your included stabilizer, jack crank handle, and the three quarter inch drive nut there on the end of that scissor jack. Again, come down, make contact with the pavement, maybe a quarter turn more. Uh, same on the way up, you don't need to go overly tight in either direction. Uh, they will stay in better working shape longer if you kind of handle those with a light touch. Now moving on to our six gallon capacity dual source water heater. Uh, the manufacturer of the water heater has some pretty specific maintenance recommendations, not only to keep you safe, but to keep this sanitary as well. Uh, anytime our unit is gonna be in storage for more than seven days, it is very important that we do go ahead, not only drain the water heater separate of the rest of the water system, but we do wanna make sure we're not keeping any water stored within the unit. So when it does come to drain this, uh, most importantly, we wanna make sure that it is at a safe working temperature. So give it ample time to go ahead and cool down. Uh, once we've done so, we need to not only depressurize the unit as a whole, but we do need to go ahead and depressurize our water heater as well. So we're gonna cut the inflow of water as a whole to the unit. So if we're going off of the fresh water holding system, uh, we need to make sure that we turn our 12 volt water pump off. If we are utilizing city water, it's as easy as turning the water off at the valve. We're then going to find the nearest hot water fixture. So the hot side of any water fixture will do. We're going to go ahead and open that line up. Now in doing so, we have effectively depressurized the water heater and we are going to be safe to drain it at that time. So when it does come to drain it, we're going to use an inch and a 16th socket and extension. We're going to remove our drain plug here. We'll see the remaining five and a half to six gallons of water kind of evacuate the tank from this location. Now on the flip side of that, when we are returning the unit back to service, it is very important that we do prime or pump six gallons of water back into the unit before we start trying to heat that up. A very similar procedure as to draining it. We need to go ahead and make sure we have uh, replaced our drain plug. And then we are gonna go ahead and repressurize the unit as a whole. So we're gonna go ahead and turn that water fixture back on or uh, turn that 12 volt water pump switch back on. Once we have done so, we are again going to go to the hot side of any water fixture. We'll turn that on. We're gonna see a slightly different scenario at this time. We're gonna see a lot more uh, water coming from that fixture, but we're also going to see a lot more air. What's happening it is, has displa is, it is displacing the air that has since filled the tank and refilling it with water. Uh, it takes about five minutes for that to complete. Uh, you'll know that it's complete when that, that flow at the fixture has normalized and it's not interrupted by those spurts of air. Now, thus far, we've talked about this as a drain plug. Uh, however, it does kind of pull double duty. It is also an anode rod. Now, an anode rod is a magnet uh, for hard water deposits, calcification, things like that, uh, generally made of aluminum or magnesium. Those hard, hard water deposits uh, attach themselves to the anode rod and effectively eat away at that as opposed to the inside of the water heater. Now, it is a consumable part. I generally see my customers get a year or two of service in between anode rod changes. Uh, when it does come to or come time to go ahead and change that out, make sure we're keeping our old one so we can take that into our RV dealer and have them match it up for us. Uh, now, another thing you can see, we do have some Teflon tape wrapped around this uh, to keep that nice and watertight uh, during different draining cycles and things like that. We're gonna wanna keep some Teflon tape with us. Uh, that way we can give that a few, uh, few wraps, keep that nice and watertight. Now it is a dual source water heater. So what that means is it not only runs on 110 volt electricity for when you're in the capacity of an RV park, but also will run on 12 volt uh, propane gas with 12 volt direct spark ignition for when you find yourself kind of off grid. Uh, both of those switches are going to be located on the inside of the coach and you can, you, you can utilize those as those sources present themselves. Uh, or if you find yourself in a scenario where you want the uh, quickest recharge rate or the uh, quickest accessibility to hot water, you can go ahead and use both sources at the same time if they are available. 
Now, not only here with the water heater, but with all of our propane appliances, it's very important that we do protect those from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects. Uh, to do so, we're gonna make sure that we do go ahead and screen off our uh, louvers and our grating here on the vent. On the underside of the camper, a little further down from the water heater, we will find our low point drains. Uh, now these are the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. This is how we are going to go ahead and drain everything in between water source and fixture. Uh, as I mentioned previously, anytime the unit is going to be in storage for more than seven days, we do need to make sure that we are draining all of the water. So uh, kind of to bring that whole uh, process full circle, if we've used the fresh water holding system, we need to go ahead and drain that holding tank. We would then next come here to these low point drains, open those up, uh, make sure we're allowing those to drain. We're then going to finish up uh, draining the water heater with that procedure we outlined previously. Next up is going to be our furnace exhaust vent. Uh, now this is not what we would consider a customer serviceable piece of equipment. Uh, so you as the consumer, the very most important thing you can do is protect this from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects. To do so, we're gonna go ahead and utilize an aftermarket screen kit for this. Uh, that will just go ahead and clamp over top of this exhaust vent. Another important thing to keep in mind is we wanna make sure that we're not setting anything in front of this, uh, that that furnace can go ahead and free breathe in the event that it needs to do so. This does blow very hot air when it is in use, so it may melt anything that you do put in front of it. The next thing we're going to talk about, which is very important, is going to be our tire pressure and lug nut torque. Now with any trailer tire, you're gonna go ahead and run those at the max tire pressure rating. In our case, that's going to be 50 PSI. So we wanna make sure that we are maintaining that number. That will give us the highest flexibility in terms of weight rating. So whether we are completely full or completely empty, that 50 PSI is gonna kinda of be our magic number. Now these lug nuts have been torqued to 100 foot pounds here in our shop. Uh, every manufacturer recommends an initial retorque procedure. Uh, generally, that will fall within the first 15, 25, 50, and 100 miles of initial travel. Uh, Intech wants us to go ahead, pull over, stop, and uh, utilize a torque wrench to make, make sure they are maintaining that 100 foot-pounds. Uh, anytime we have any tire service done, uh, that procedure is going to have to go ahead and start over, so keep that in mind. Next up is going to be our 30 amp power supply. Now this is going to plug into our unit one way. Uh, if we go ahead and take a look here at the plug, you'll see that we have two slanted receptacles and one kind of L-shaped one. We're gonna make sure we line up those uh, shapes and plug straight in. Easier said than done. Once we've done that, we're gonna push in fully. Well, this is a twist lock connection, so we rotate that an eighth inch towards the right. That's going to go ahead and lock that in. We then do have this secondary collar that we can screw down that's gonna secure that connection uh, even further. Now this is your shore cord, comes with the unit. Uh, generally they're between 25 and 30 feet in length. Now one thing that I do recommend for every unit that I do deliver and that is going to be adding a 30 amp surge protector, uh, whether that's going to be a hard mount installed into the camper or an inline plug, a uh, ton of stuff going on within these units electronically and the only way to effectively protect those is going to be with a surge protector. So that's not only gonna protect you from substandard wiring, used and abused power supplies, but also natural surges as well. Now here at the dealership, we have a few products that we specifically recommend. If you have any questions on those products or how to use them, feel free to give our parts department a call. They would be more than happy to go ahead and educate you on just what you need to know. Now to the right of that, we have a cable satellite inlet. That's just going to be a pass-through connection uh, to the designated TV areas of the camper. That's going to go ahead and allow us to feed TV services to the unit, whether that be an aftermarket satellite package uh, or a park cable service. And then next to that, we have a uh, portable solar port. Uh, this is going to be a direct connection to the battery system. Uh, what this is designed for is a briefcase or folding style solar panel uh, that will allow us to make a connection here on the body of the camper, take our panel out into the sun and directionalize it as needed. Uh, moving on, we have our dump valves down below. Uh, we can see we have our dump valves transitioning here through the frame. They are marked uh, on the body of the camper. And then we have our uh, dump tube here with a bayonet fitting uh, starting uh, with the proper connection of the bayonet fitting here. Now this cap needs to be in place anytime we are traveling down the road. 
Uh, we are going to rotate that to the left and sometimes these get stuck on. Uh, once we've done so, we can take a look here kind of at the working parts of it. We have four prongs along the outside there of the tube and corresponding keyholes. Now we will find that our sewage hose uh, does have those same kind of keyholes. Uh, either way, whether it's the cap or the sewage hose, we put the cap or sewage hose in the halfway position and we rotate that until we go ahead and fully engage on those studs. Uh, now when it does come to dump, it's very important that we do uh, utilize the proper procedure. Now starting off, these valves need to be in the closed position anytime we are using the camper. We want to keep those tanks in as wet or flowing condition as we can so when we do go uh, specifically to evacuate that black water holding tank that that solid body waste and toilet paper and is easily uh, able to evacuate that tank. So we're going to keep them in the closed position. We're going to use the onboard monitor panel that's going to let us know when it is time to dump. The proper kind of way of doing it is generally going to be relieving the black water tank first. Uh, once we are satisfied, we go ahead and close that valve off because we want to make sure that we are treating this kind of like a vacuum lock. Those two valves should never be open at the same time. It's our goal to avoid any cross contamination or back feeding in between the two systems. So once we've went ahead and closed that black water valve, we can go ahead and open up our gray water, allow that to rinse any shared plumbing in between the two systems as well as our uh, sewage hose on the way out. Next up is going to be our sewage hose uh, storage location. Uh, this does have a little lock there on the door, so we go ahead and unlock it. And then when not in use, our sewage hose can go ahead and store. Uh, that's going to keep us from having to store that maybe in one of our baggage compartments or anything like that uh, out of the way and kind of self-contained. And then moving up here, we have our water connections. Uh, so if we open up our water door, we're going to see a uh, couple fittings there. The one on the left is going to be how we fill our potable water holding tank. Uh, if we're doing any off-grid camping, that's going to be our water option. We're going to stick our drinking water hose directly here into the orifice. We will fill up till we are satisfied. Once we have done so, we're going to make sure that we do cap this off. Now, just a reminder, this is non-pressurized water. The manufacturer has included a 12-volt water pump within the unit that is going to go ahead and pressurize that system, draw that water up from the tank, uh, to the fixtures to make it usable. Now on the right is going to be our city water connection. We're going to use this in the capacity of an RV park or any time that we do have access to full-time running water. Uh, water pressure becomes very important when we do talk about our city water connection. Uh, what that means is we do want to make sure that we use a water pressure regulator at all times. Generally, you will find that these units are rated for a working water pressure in between 50 and 75 PSI. Uh, it's very important that we do not exceed those numbers uh, and we are going to use a water pressure regulator to make sure that we do not do so. Uh, I generally will recommend that my customers hook this, or hook this as close to the water source as they can, so directly onto the fixture. You're then going to take your drinking water hose, screw that in line there on the water pressure regulator, ultimately making our connection here on the camper by rotating this uh, hose bound connection. Below our water connections, we're going to find a quick connect uh, sprayer. Uh, this is all self-contained, so we can go ahead and remove our sprayer. Uh, and then we kind of see the business end here, which is gonna again utilize that quick connect style fitting. Uh, what we're going to do is slide the locking collar back. We will insert our male end fully. Once we've done so, that hose starts to pressurize. Uh, so we do wanna make sure that this is turned off so we're not spraying it all around. When it does come to put this back, uh, a couple things. Now this may or may not be hard for you to disconnect while this hose is fully pressurized. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to turn the inflow of water off and depressurize it here at the sprayer. Once we've done so, we can slide this locking collar back. That's going to be, be removed very easily. Uh, it works better if you go ahead and tuck the sprayer back there into the coiled part of the hose. And that will all, again, kind of feed back into there and be self-contained and easily stored. Starting up top here, you're going to notice a pre-wire from the manufacturer. What that's going to do for you is make it very easy to go ahead and add a rear view backup camera if you wish to do so. Uh, now that wiring is going to go ahead and get its power from the marker lights. What that will allow you to see is if you go ahead and install a camera, anytime your marker lights are in the on position, that camera is going to be powered up and give you a full time rear view. Uh, only other thing that is, is really worth talking about here at the rear is going to be our receiver 
Uh, now that is rated for 175 pounds. Uh, that can go ahead and uh, be utilized for either a bike rack, a cargo, cargo rack, or whatever uh, you know you find uh, that it may be helpful for. Uh, but most importantly, we do want to make sure that we are not exceeding that 175 pound weight limit. One of the really cool features of the Terra Oasis is going to be our outside kitchen area. Uh, now this is locked into place for travel. Uh, we go ahead and release that uh, locking mechanism by pushing down on that red handle. And you can see that this is going to slide out there for us. Uh, now what we have is going to be a, a dual source uh, kind of ref uh, refrigerator cooler type thing. Uh, which will not only work if you're off grid, but on grid, grid, on grid as well. And then we also have a small little uh, suburban griddle as well. Uh, now this tabletop is going to be removed. That's going to give us greatest ac greater access to these appliances. Uh, now it does install here on the side of the camper, uh, utilizing these kind of button, this button assembly. Now one thing that we do want to be very careful of is of course these components are metal. Uh, when we are kind of installing that onto the body, we want to make sure we're not doing any damage to our decals here. Uh, you can see we have the kind of corresponding cutouts here for those buttons. Uh, you're going to carefully install this into place. And sometimes it can again be a little fiddly, but once you've done so, you just give it a little push down to make sure it is fully seated. And then you can further kind of extend this kind of outdoor kitchen area. Uh, taking a look here at our Norcold refrigerator cooler, uh, needs to be buckled in for travel. Once we go ahead and remove that buckle, we can take a look here on the inside uh, and you do have some uh, grating uh, to go ahead and separate your uh, food. We have our controls here to the right side. Uh, what we do is we power it on. There's a toggle switch here on the front side. Once I've done so, we can see that digital display go ahead and turn on. Uh, we have up or down arrows to control our set temperature. If we want to change that temperature, so this is going to show us the real time temperature when it is in standby. We go ahead, hit that, hit that uh, set button. That's going to start blinking for us. That will allow us to go ahead uh, and change that temperature uh, to uh, where we would like it. And then moving on here to our griddle top. Uh, this is going to light very easily. So we first we need to go ahead and remove the griddle top momentarily. That's going to expose our burner here. As we make our way around here, uh, we want to go ahead and connect using our propane line that is stowed here at the backside of the unit. We feed that down through the trailer body and we again see a quick connect fitting here. Now this is going to be utilized in the same fashion as the quick connect water line we've seen previously. We slide the locking collar back, insert the male end fully. That's going to slide back into that locking position. Now we do have a valve here, which is going to be different from the water line we looked at previously. We need to move that into the on position. With any valve, if you're going with the flow, that's going to be on. Now we cannot connect or disconnect with that in the on position, so we need to go ahead, turn that off. That's going to allow us to disconnect. We do want to make sure that we feed our propane line back up and stow that in the correct position so it's not going to go ahead and get pinched when we go ahead and close the uh, slide out kitchen here. The manufacturer has made it very easy for us to go ahead and light our cooktop griddle here. Uh, what, what they have done is they have included a sparker or igniter on the unit or built into the unit. So what we do is we kind of prime it so we'll go ahead and hold this in, uh, count to 10 in our head. Once we've done so, we slide that to the left there. That's going to activate that igniter. If we don't get it the first try, we're going to again hold that in for a spell, rotate that to the left. Now, once we see some flame here, we're going to make sure that we uh, give that ample time to heat up that thermal coupler, generally two or three seconds. Once we've done so, we can actually kind of fine tune this uh, to our desired intensity of the flame. Next up, we are going to find a couple all-weather outlets uh, that will allow us to further enjoy this space if we want to go ahead and uh, plug any accessories in here uh, while maybe, again, enjoying this space. Uh, we have this set, and then a little further down next to the entry door, we have another set. Uh, speaking of the entry door, our steps are going to easily be folded in and out. Uh, what you're going to do is fold the bottom step over the top step and then all or both of those, I should say, will slide right in there uh, and that's it. That just about covers the walkthrough here on the exterior of the Oasis. We're going to hop on the inside and take a look at those accessories and appliances.
So right inside the entry door, first thing up, we are going to find a couple 15 amp outlets. Uh, below that, you're going to see a couple USB chargers as well. So you should have no problem powering your devices. Uh, and then we have our main light switch cluster here. First up is going to be our main overhead lights. We have our dinette accent light, which is going to be an LED light bar across the front window there. Our cabinet lights are uh, going to be uh, some blue accent lighting behind the cabinetry. And we have our awning extend and retract switch. Now this is a momentary switch, so we can really uh, choose the amount uh, or the positioning of that awning. If we don't want to run it full to, all the way out, we do not need to do so. And then we have our wind protection. Now the awning is equipped with wind protection. So uh, in the event that it becomes gusty outside, it's going to automatically retract for us. You see a set one and a set two. Uh, they just vary in the level of intensity of that wind protection. We have our awning light switch, so just a LED light switch that runs the full width of the awning, our exterior porch lights, and our front accent lights as well. Now down below that, we have our fire extinguisher. Now this is a very important piece of safety equipment. We want to go ahead and inspect this and make sure it is in good working order. Every single time we take the unit out for this particular unit, it does have a pressure gauge here. We do just want to go ahead and inspect that and make sure it is reading full pressure. So next up, we have another very important piece of safety equipment. This is not only going to be our smoke alarm, but it's also going to be our carbon monoxide detector. Uh, as mentioned with the fire extinguisher, we do need to in, uh, test all of our safety equipment every single time we take the unit out. Uh, single test button here, so we're going to push that. It's going to let you know that it is in good working order with a audible tone. This does run on a 9-volt battery. It's going to be my recommendation that you do keep a spare 9-volt battery with the unit in the event that you're outside uh, enjoying the space and find this uh, to start to go dead on you. I start indicating with that chirp that everybody loves. Uh, we want to make sure that we're not removing the battery at any time and that we do have a spare battery to replace it with. As we make our way here into the dinette, we will see our max air fan controls. Uh, what we have here is the ability to open and close the vent. Uh, we can also choose our fan speed one through four, uh, or we can go ahead and turn the fan off as well. Next up here in the dinette, we do have our pull down shade. Uh, this is going to be like a projector screen. So you pull it down, it will stay in that extended position. And then when we want to retract it, we just go ahead and pull that a little further up and it will go ahead and retract for us. Above my head, you're also going to find uh, the cabinetry. Now these are not only going to stay open when you fully extend them, but if we go a little bit closed, they are also soft closed as well. So we don't have to worry about those going ahead and slamming down. So next up, we are going to talk about how we can make this dinette into a secondary sleeping area. Uh, so first things first, we are going to take our cushion here. Now this is generally stored underneath the bed in the bedroom. Uh, what we're going to do is match that up with the shape of the uh, tabletop. Uh, if we see here on the bottom, it will utilize some Velcro straps. It's going to keep that in position while you are actually, um, you know, sleeping. So we slide those Velcro straps uh, on each side of the table. We're then going to come down here and we need to separate this tabletop from the top uh, of the, or the support, support pole, I should say. Uh, you can lock this into position with this screw knob. As I rotate the tabletop there, you'll get a better view of that screw there. That's going to keep this from, from, you know, rotating. You may find yourself wanting to rotate this to make it easier to swing around to the back of the bench seat. Uh, but once we've done that, we go ahead, uh, we loosen that up. We're going to lift this tabletop out of position. You may need to wiggle it a few times. Once you've done that, uh, we do need to go ahead and separate the support pole from the floor, floor flange. We're going to push this release button here that's going to allow us to unscrew that now when we're installing this we want to be sure that we're not really like hammering down on it i have seen the ratcheting mechanism in these floor flanges kind of get bound up if somebody uh, makes a habit of, of kind of over tightening them we're then going to take our shorter support pole and we're going to make sure we screw that in uh, making sure we're not over tightening it so we just want it enough to be secure so it's not going to move around on us we then take our tabletop and set that down on top. Of course, it, it's a lot easier to do so if you've preemptively moved these cushions out of the way. 
Uh, but once we do have full engagement here, we do want to tighten this down again to keep things nice and secure uh, and keep it from rotating on us. As we make our way here into the kitchen, the first thing you're going to notice is this kind of large single bay farmhouse style uh, sink. Now we have the countertop extender in place. It's going to make it uh, easier for you if you're like prepping a meal in this space or something like this. This easily does kind of roll up and out of the way to go ahead and get a better look there uh, at the sink. Uh, now you will have multiple spray modes on this fixture and we can go ahead and relieve that from its mount uh, to go ahead and get kind of more movement out of it. Uh, now also we have a uh, Dometic dual burner cooktop here. Uh, does have a tempered glass lid. Goes without saying that we need to, if we have been using this, we need to make sure that we allow this cast iron grating to cool down enough for us to go ahead and close the lid here. We also do have a built-in electric igniter. Uh, the idea being is that we will hold the burner in the light position, hold this igniter in until we see a flame there at the burner, give it a couple seconds to heat up that thermal coupler, and then we can go ahead and choose the intensity of our flame. Next up here, we have our kind of oven option here in this particular unit. Now this is not only a convection oven, a microwave oven, but it's also, also kind of like a grill as well. If we take a look here on the inside, we can kind of see some of those features. You do have a burner up top, a burner below. We have vents for our convection uh, and also a uh, knob here that we can go ahead and attach a turntable to use that kind of more like a traditional style microwave. Uh, up top, we have some presets. Uh, temperatures and things like that are kind of main modes here. So we can kind of see as I go through those, want to make sure we turn that off. Uh, we can choose time and temperature here on the right uh, and then start and clear off. Above our television set here, we do have a cabinet that lifts up. Uh, this is going to go ahead and expose our lithium ready converter, uh, a fuse panel box and breaker box. So here on the right side, uh, we have our 110 volt appliances. They're gonna utilize a resettable light switch style breaker. On the left side, we can see our automotive blade style replaceable fuses. Uh, those are going to be for our 12 volt appliances. Everything in terms of function is labeled here on the door. Uh, my recommendation ultimately is going to be carry a spare set of fuses with you uh, in the event that you're out enjoying the unit and you lose functionality to one of your 12 volt appliances. Uh, you're going to be best suited if you have a replacement uh, fuse to, of course, uh, return that back to service. And then also we have our battery disconnect switch here. What that's going to do is go ahead and isolate that battery from the 12 volt system. Uh, you'll utilize that for periods of long-term storage. With any 12 volt system, you will have nominal or phantom draws throughout that system. Uh, from the day to day, that's no big deal, but compounded by many weeks or months in storage, it will start to wear and tear on the battery. So when it does come to disconnect, we just switch this into the off position and you can see that we have lost full functionality to the unit because we have just isolated that battery from the rest of the system. So our TV is going to be secured here. Uh, it takes a slight amount of pressure to go ahead and relieve that. And once we do, we can see that it is on a pivotable mount. Uh, it can go ahead and kind of be directionalized to where we uh, find it suited best. Now, we're going to do our best to kind of move this out of the way so we can get a shot back here behind the TV. Uh, what we're going to see there is going to be our antenna booster. Uh, now this unit is equipped with the omnidirectional digital over the air television antenna that is mounted on the roof. As long as we see that red light on, that's going to allow us to do a channel search through the TV and pull in programming dependent on the strength of our signal. Uh, now it does have an on off switch. So the button right beside the light is going to turn that antenna booster on and off. On the side of the cabinet here, we are going to see our command control. Now we do have a switch cluster along the bottom. We're going to touch base on that here in just a second. Uh, but looking here at the actual command control logo, this is going to give us a real time readout of where our tanks sit in level of full. So if we press the fresh water, we can see that that is completely full. Our black water is empty and our gray water is empty. Our battery will also indicate full. And it's gonna indicate full anytime you are plugged into shore power to get a true or accurate readout of where your battery sits in level of charge. We do need to go ahead and unplug from shore power and then evaluate uh, from this position. We also down along the bottom have our water pump switch. Uh, we know that these uh, appliances are on if the lighted switch is on. So water pump switch, that's gonna pressurize that freshwater holding system, draw that water up to the fixtures and make it useful. 
We have our tank heater uh, that's designed for cold weather camp to keep our tanks from freezing, as well as our line heater as well. And then we have our water heater sources, both gas and electric, as mentioned there on the exterior of the unit. We can use these as those sources present themselves. Uh, or if we want to take advantage of the fastest recharge rate available, we can go ahead and use both sources. Below our command control, we're going to find our Jensen stereo unit. This is going to allow us to take advantage of AM, FM radio, uh, Bluetooth connectability, as well as HDMI or USB in. Uh, the, the functions of this are very easy to use. I find most people can generally work themselves around it. Uh, although if you do have any questions of this, it is going to carry its own service manual. You can either consult that manual or give us a call. We'd be happy to walk, walk you through it. Another really cool thing we're going to find here inside the Oasis is going to be our Norcold 12 volt compressor style refrigerator. Uh, this is going to give us much more accessibility and freedom than your traditional compressor style three way refrigerator that most RVs are carrying these days. Uh, very easy to use. Of course, we have our power on switch here. So we go ahead and hold that uh, until we go ahead and boot up. We have our temperature control here, plus or minus. And then we have separate controls for the ice box as well as the refrigerator. And then we also have this nighttime mode, which is a really cool feature. What that's going to allow you to do is it's gonna take into account that while you're sleeping, you're probably not going to be opening and closing the door. So it's going to run at a lower rate, which is still gonna keep your food good, uh, but it's not going to kind of have to overwork itself because it, you're not gonna be open and closing the refrigerator and freezer, uh, losing that energy. Underneath the refrigerator, we are going to find our carbon monoxide propane leak detector. Uh, it is very important that we do test this every single time we take the unit out. The only button that you will find on the appliance is that test button. Uh, so before each trip, we want to go ahead and push that button. Uh, the appliance will let us know it's in good working shape with a series of light flashes and audible tones. Once we've done so, we are good to go. All right, here in the restroom, uh, you know, nothing too crazy. You'll find most of these things in most RV restrooms. Uh, but first thing is going to be our overhead light switch. Uh, that also controls the backlighting here on the mirror, which is just a really cool feature. Uh, small hand washing sink. We also have our main GFI outlet here. Uh, on this particular unit, in most units, the receptacles are all on the same circuit. If one of them were to get overloaded, uh, they all kind of follow suit since they are all tied to this GFI outlet. Uh, just like in your restroom at home, you probably have one. Uh, it is very easily resettable. So if we take a look here uh, and we do not see a light here on the outlet, we need to reset it. We're going to push the reset button and that will go ahead and restore functionality to our uh, receptacles. Also here in the restroom, we'll find our porcelain bowl toilet. Now this is going to utilize a pedal style flush. So it's going to be a light press to feed water to the bowl. And then of course a full press to go ahead and flush. Uh, and so my recommendations, if your specific camping situation allows you to do so, let's make sure we're taking nice long flushes. We want to again, keep that black water holding system in as wet or flowing condition as we can. Uh, any kind of toilet chemical or toilet treatments are going to be introduced into the system uh, right from the top here. So of course, follow the manufacturer's recommendations of the specific product you're using, but 99% of them are going to be uh, integrated into the system from this location. Now, also it goes without saying, we do need to make sure we're using the proper RV grade single ply toilet paper. And again, uh, keep that wet or keep that black tank in as wet or flowing condition as you can. Also here in the restroom above my head, we will find kind of your standard RV style exhaust fan. Uh, it does have a single push button to go ahead and turn that fan on. With all of our vents, it's important to note that they do need to be closed during travel. Uh, it's gonna wanna be uh, probably one of the last things you check. Uh, the reason being is uh, they, they will catch wind, may or may not be there uh, when you get to where you're going if you forget to close them. Here we are in the shower portion of the restroom. Now this is of course separate from the kind of toilet or bathroom portion of the restroom. Uh, in here, nothing too crazy. Uh, of course, you have a nice bench seat here uh, on off switch for the lights. We also do have an exhaust fan above my head, gonna function just the same as the one we went over in the restroom portion. Uh, on our shower head, we have a multi-positional arm here so we can choose the level of that. 
on our shower head. We're going to find on off on the sprayer. What that's going to allow us to do is kind of do military or Navy style showers. So we can go ahead and uh, conserve our water consumption. Uh, other than that, it's pretty straightforward in terms of use. Uh, you have kind of towel rack storage, things like that. So first things first here in the bedroom, uh, we have this beautiful sliding door here. Uh, just like the warning here says, now when we're going down the road, that safety latch does need to be engaged. That's going to keep that from opening and closing inadvertently. Uh, that safety latch is this guy right here. So we do want to go ahead and lift that out of the way. Uh, now dur during normal use, we don't need to use that. The door is held open uh, by a really strong magnet there. So if we go ahead and, and go to the full open position, uh, that's going to stick on that magnet. And then once we go ahead and shut the door, we can lock that closed by using our pressure foot pad here. So we push down on that. And that's going to keep you from being able to open up that uh, door. And if we want to unlock it, we press on the silver portion of that. It's spring loaded. That's going to go ahead and unlock for us and be held in place by the magnet. The TV here in the bedroom is going to utilize that same mount that we've seen in the common areas of the camper. It is just a pressure style. So it does take a little bit of pressure to come out. Uh, from there, again, we can go ahead and directionalize that, uh, you know, to get a better viewing angle. So right next to the bed here, we have our bedroom light switch. Uh, we also have a couple 15 amp outlets as well as a couple USBs there to charge your devices. Uh, storage on both sides of the bed. We also have our reading lights here. Now those are going to come on blue. If we hold those for a few seconds longer, they will turn to a bright white LED. Also here in the bedroom, we are going to find our thermostat for our furnace and air conditioner. Uh, a lot of different kind of options in operating this, but the basic features are going to be our on off button here. Uh, we have our fan speed here. So if we go to either low or high here on our fan speed, that fan's going to continue to run whether or not it meets this uh, thermostatically set temperature or not. We have our main mode button. That's how we're going to switch in between the different modes between air conditioner and furnace, things like that. We have our clock button, as it sounds, set the time and temp, or excuse me, set the time. Uh, programming is going to be setting the times that we would like the uh, unit to run. Uh, and then again, inside temperature, that's gonna show us the real time temperature of the unit. Uh, Fahrenheit, Celsius, up or down arrows there, uh, again, to adjust that temperature. Now, if I hold this mode button here, we can go ahead and go into our furnace mode. Now, once it realizes what I'm doing, it's going to kick off that air conditioner. It will kick on the blower motor of the furnace immediately. 16 seconds after that, it's actually going to ignite. By that 30 second mark, it will start producing noticeable heat. Uh, would not be surprised if a unit of this size if it actually set off the smoke alarm. Uh, that's something you want to be prepared for. Lighting the furnace within this unit is like lighting the furnace in your house. Uh, the first time for the year it's like doing that every single time going down the road you're going to find that uh, debris and dust deposits itself on the exhaust of the furnace uh, as it continues to run within that first 15 minutes of operation if it does set off the smoke alarm that's not something you need to be worried about right below our thermostat we have some light switches here bedroom lights uh, just a secondary switch uh, from the one we've seen by the bed we have our cabinet lights, which are again going to give us that blue accent lighting all around. And then we also have a secondary main light switch. So if we come to bed, we forget to turn our lights off. Uh, we don't have to go all the way into the common area of the camper to do so. We can go ahead and turn those lights off there. Also, we have our max air fan controls. Now we touched base on this uh, in the kid, uh, excuse me, the dining room area of the camper. Uh, functionality wise, it will function just the same as the one we spoke of earlier. All right, guys, that just about covers the walkthrough here on the Terra Oasis. We hope you enjoyed it, maybe learned a thing or two. Uh, if you do have any further questions or comments, please don't hesitate to give us a call or comment below. Thank you so much. Have a great day.